So it's probably about time, huh? Um, yay. Okay. Uh, hello. Good morning, DrupalCon. Um, thank you for coming to listen to my entirely uncaffeinated self uh, ramble on about automatic updates for an hour, which, by the way, is almost in Drupal core, as you can see from the title. I was talking to my friend Paige the other night. She asked me if I knew the game Two Truths and a Lie. And uh, I have two truths and a lie. Here are the truths. Uh, there is a module called Automatic Updates, which we wrote. It does automatically update Drupal core. The lie is that it's in core. Um, we thought it might be in core when we submitted this session, but that hasn't happened yet for reasons I will explain. So let's get into it. Um, little about me. My name is Adam Globus Honick. I go by Fenaproxima on uh, Drupal.org and uh, on Veron's. Um, I'm a staff software engineer at the Drupal Acceleration team at Acquia, which does a lot of really good core work. Um, I got a pretty long history working on core. I'm a co-maintainer of the media system. Um, I used to be a, mi a maintainer of the migration system, and officially I still am, but I don't even think I know how that system works anymore. Um, I also maintain the lightning distribution for Acquia. Uh, may it rest in peace. And I have a co-presenter whom I will delegate to if I just forget what I'm talking about. So. Here. All right. Uh, I'm Ted Bowman. I'm Ted Bow on Drupal.org, uh, principal software engineer, also at the Acquia's Drupal Acceleration team. Uh, I'm the tech lead of Automatic Updates Initiative, uh, co-maintainer of Layout Builder and Setting Tray module, and uh, yeah, that's it. Generally a smart programmer, too. And that is my dog. Yeah, the dog in my picture, by the way, not my dog, my housemate's dog. <laughs> She's a total sweetie, but... <laughs> Well, that, well that, I didn't say anything. <laughs> you just filled in the blanks. So um, before I get into kind of the nitty gritty, I want to do a little bit of philosophizing here about why we need automatic updates in core. Um, the biggest and most important reason is because, you know, as we all know, Drupal's update process is painful and cumbersome and has been for a very long time. And when you're releasing security updates that you really want people to get onto as quickly as possible, that's not really good. So our main goal is to keep as many Drupal sites as possible, as secure as possible, as quickly as possible, as easily as possible. And the flip side of that is that we need to make Composer as easy and painless as possible. Composer not being always the most friendly piece of software that has ever writ been written. Um, but this is the way we assemble Drupal code bases now. It is how we've done it since Drupal 8, and so we have to try to take the pain out of it if we can. So this is why we need automatic updates, and this is what has guided uh, what we've built. But it's not the what we have built is not necessarily meant for every single use case under the sun. Um, the people we think will get the most value out of automatic updates as we've created it are those who don't have, you know, don't have the time or the budget or whatever to do Drupal's complicated update process. You don't you don't want to hire developers to just update a site. Um, hang on one second. I keep this open. If you're a technical person who is responsible for hosting many Drupal sites, um, unless you've got really good scripting foo, uh, that's going to be a colossal pain in the ass, keeping them all up to date as quickly as possible. So we hope that, this, that what we've built will provide value for you. Um, if you're just somebody who doesn't have access to the command line on your host or would prefer to avoid it, and if you're trying to avoid using Composer at the command line, I don't blame you, um, this is for you. And you know, ultimately, it's really built for anybody who finds, for whatever reason, that you cannot do security updates for Drupal in a timely, in a timely way. And that's who, it's, that's who it's really meant for. It's not as much meant for those with you know, complicated sites with development teams of several people who, you know, when every change needs a pull request and review from a bunch of people and you put it through a continuous integration pipeline and there's a complicated deployment. I'm not saying there's no value in automatic updates if this is you. I'm just saying it's not the main thing we were thinking about building this. This is for what we call long tail sites, which I don't know what that means, but I think it just means the people from the previous slide. <laughs> um, so. Thank you, Peter, for the uh, much, much better definition than I had. Um, so with all that in mind, uh, what exactly is automatic updates? What have we built here? Well, we've built 
two modules in a library, and this slide vaguely resembles a pyramid because that's effectively how it's built. There's this library that has nothing to do with Drupal that we made called Composer Stager. That sits on the bottom. I'm not going to really talk about that because it's, you know, it's technical. It's really under the hood. Um, then there's two Drupal modules, one of which is called Package Manager, and then on top of that is built automatic updates. So from the top down, I'll get into that. Um, first, the automatic updates module. This is a module that provides a, a user interface and tooling for updating Drupal core only. It is not concerned with updating contributed modules or themes. It replaces the core update UI, which has existed for a while. It's meant for updating modules and themes, but it doesn't, it doesn't really work. Um, I don't know if it's worked for a long time because it's not composer aware. It kind of expects you to upload a tarball, which is just not how we do things anymore. Modules have composer dependencies. Um, so automatic updates replaces that UI with a new one that is meant just for updating core. Um, it is capable of doing updates in the background, and it's also built on top of package manager, which is which is what it uses to do the uh, to do the the plumbing basically. So to give justice to the plumbing, uh, package manager is another Drupal module that is included with it's currently included with automatic updates. It'll be its own module in core. Package Manager has no user interface at all. It uh, is strictly an API module, and what its purpose is is to manage the existence of temporary copies of the Drupal site, uh, which we call stages. Um, and the temporary copies of the site, those are what get updated before it's all copied back into your live site. It does all that using Composer Stager under the hood to do the heavy lifting. Um, this this API is also used by Project Browser uh, because that's how it installs modules. It makes a temporary copy, installs the module over there, then brings it in. And that's all mediated by Package Manager. So a little bit about how it works. I'm not going to get too deep into the weeds about it. But suspense. how it works, this is really how Package Manager works, is any given update has four phases, uh, which we collectively call the life cycle of the update. The first, and this, they happen in this order. The first phase is called the create phase, and that's where we make a temporary copy of the entire Drupal site, which we call the stage. Um, that temporary copy does not create, it doesn't copy um, like uploaded files, uh, it doesn't deal with the database, it ignores site settings, a bunch of other stuff. It's not really a usable copy of the site, it's just containing the code of the Drupal site, so core, vendor dependencies, modules and, modules and themes. So that's the create phase. In the require phase, we run composer commands on that copy. Most of the time, we run composer require, which is why we call it the require phase. In theory, you could run any composer commands, but that's about the require phase is about doing composer stuff to the, to the stage. Then the apply phase, uh, which is the most sensitive, the phase that is, I don't want to scare you, the most sensitive to failure, which is why there's a warning. Um, the apply phase is where we take all the changes that have happened over in the stage and we copy them back into the live site. Um, and then the final phase, the fourth phase, is the destroy phase where we just delete the stage because changes have been copied to the live site. We don't really need the stage anymore. So this is how it always works. Create, require, apply, destroy, which is almost crud. It's crad, which I don't know <laughs> if that's useful at all. Um, additionally, at every step of this process, uh, there's a ton of validation that we do because we're always trying to make sure that everything looks good on the live site, that there's no unexpected changes that have happened, that things that we don't expect to update are not going to accidentally be updated. Um, so we're doing a ton of validation just to make sure we don't break your site. Um, a lot of validation bordering on paranoia, but you know when it comes to breaking sites, I think paranoia is good. Um, and this, uh, every, every phase of the stage also has um, events dispatch. There's an event dispatched before a phase begins, and there's an event dispatched after a phase begins. And those events are, we use them. You're, they're also meant for you to hook into to do custom things if you need to. So it's very, it's somewhat extensible, um, but this is basically how it works. That is the 30,000 foot view of it. So before I move on, I just want to recap everything. That's pretty much all the theory of this thing. Our goals in automatic updates are to keep Drupal secure and do so by making Composer as easy as we can make it. Um, the most useful, or the, we think the most useful case is for sites that just don't have the resources to do Drupal's 
painful update process every time a security update comes out, but presumably you would like to be secure. Most, I think people like to be secure. And we do this with two modules, automatic updates, which is meant for updating cores strictly, and it is built on top of Package Manager, which does the grunt work and heavy lifting on that. Package Manager has four phases of an update, create, require, apply, destroy. And that is how it works. So. In order to do automatic updates, um, a bunch of things have to be right. Uh, you have to be set up correctly. There is a very long list of things that have to be correct. Most of them are not that important. And they, a lot of them are edge cases and things we're just checking like in case in case. But there are some things that are very important. And these are the ones that sort of leap to mind. For me, the most important thing is that the code of Drupal core and of modules and vendor dependencies has to be writable by either the web server or the terminal, um, depending on configuration. And that's you know, just kind of par for the course because this is a system where Drupal literally rewrites itself. Um, so it has to be writable, it has to be able to write itself. Um, that's not a thing we check very deeply. We sort of check certain critical points in the file system to make sure that, you know, you have write permission. Because um, if we tried to check every single file in a Drupal site, it would just take forever. So that's one thing. That's, a very, that's probably the most important thing. Um, another super important thing is that Composer, as I said, we call Composer commands um, on the stage. So the Composer executable has to be somewhere that we can find it. It has to be runnable by PHP. Um, you have to have a valid... Um, composer.json in your project. You know, you have to have a properly set up composer project. Um, you can't have any unsupported composer plugins installed. And I want to explain that because it sounds draconian on its face. But the thing about composer plugins is composer has its own plugin ecosystem and the plugins can do basically anything they want. They can change the file system in completely unpredictable ways, which to us, unpredictability is a bad thing. Um, and that sounds like site's gonna break. So for us, what we do out of the box is we have a list of plugins for Composer that we know are safe. Stuff like the, there's a patcher plugin that is, I think, fairly widely used. Um, you know, Core has plugins to like scaffold files into, um, into the Drupal site. And there's a few others as well. So we have a list of known safe plugins. They're like, okay, these ones can run. And if you have any plugins installed that aren't in that list, we will basically say, no, I'm sorry, you can't do this. That being said, if you are a savvy user and you know what plugins you have and you're like, shut up automatic updates, this is safe, it is possible to configure this to allow plugins that you want. But by default, our, um, our impulse is to be more careful and more conservative about that. Um, another thing that is, must be correct, you can't be in a multi-site uh, to use Package Manager. The reason you cannot be in a multi-site is because when you update core or modules for that matter, you know, caches need to be cleared, routes have to be rebuilt, probably database updates have to run, update.php. Um, and there's no mechanism in core right now to sort of centrally coordinate that across a multi-site. I'm pretty sure that there are systems out there which can do it, but there's not one in core that we know of anyway. Um, so for that reason, because it would be complicated and there's no way in core to do it, uh, we don't let you use package manager in a okay. multi-site right now. One other thing with that is we stop you from like uninstalling modules while an update's going on. And in the future, we'll probably stop you from doing other things while an update is going on. So it would be very hard to stop those other sites from uninstalling modules at the same time. And yeah. multi-site by definition, they're using the same code base. So yeah. Um, yeah, right now it's not, we stop it from being used. Yeah, or you know, the only thing worse than breaking one site is breaking many sites in a multi-site at the same time. Um, also, Composer needs to be secure to use um, Package Manager, by which I mean it needs to be using HTTPS and TLS to download stuff from the internet, which, to be clear, it will do by default. It is, so unless you've specifically turned off HTTPS for some reason, which, why would you do it? But even, unless you've done that, you're okay here. There's other conditions. There's a lot of them. These are the most important ones. The good news is you do not have to remember all of this crap because if there are problems detected, the UI will tell you that there are problems. Um, and it'll do that on the status report, as you can see here. It'll also do this like on just the admin screen before you try to update if it finds a problem. And if it does find problems, it won't let you update. The button that says update will just not be there. Um, so we're, we're pretty strict about enforcing these generally. So that's sort of, that's all the caveats and stuff. The way this actually works, 
is there's two ways to do a Drupal core update, un uh, attended updates and unattended updates. Attended updates are real easy. Uh, you go to you know, admin reports, updates, and if there's an update available, it'll tell you. You can read the release notes if you want, but then you just push the button, and a batch job begins, and you wait, and then there's a confirmation screen before we apply the, um, apply the update to the live site. We recommend you back up. I will be repeating this point. Um, and then you hit the button again. Another batch job begins. And when that's finished, ideally, you see update complete. And you're on the latest core. Isn't that magical? Um, I Hold for applause. Oh, that's fun. So that's an attended update. We call it an attended update because you are actually sitting there and you're actually clicking the buttons. And if something breaks and goes wrong, you are in a position to react to that problem right then and there. Um, uh, attended updates are more permissive than unattended updates in the sense of they'll let you update um, from, say, Drupal 10.0 point something to Drupal 10.1. Um, they'll let you update across miners. Our reasoning there is that, you know, Updating across minor versions of core is a little bit more disruptive. More things could go wrong. And um, if you're actually sitting there, you will catch those problems. And so we'll let you get away with more stuff. Um, the other way is unattended updates. These are the ones that happen while you sleep. Uh, the goal is to set it and forget it, basically. They sit and run in the background. And these are more tightly scoped. They can update you either to security releases, which is the default, or all patch releases. What I mean by that is like if you're on Drupal 10.0.3 or something, and 10.0.4 comes out, but it's not a security release, it'll just be ignored. But if 10.0.5 comes out and it is a security release, we'll update you to that, because we want to keep you secure. Um, or you can say, no, 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 that's OK. Just go to all patch releases, and then it'll update to all patch releases. Unattended updates will never, ever update you to um, across minor versions of core. It will not go from 10.0 to 10.1 or any other minor jump like that because of the potential for breakage. Um, unattended updates, if a problem is detected that, will, that could break updates, like, oh, suddenly some file that became not writable and we need to write to it, it'll email you about that. So you should never wake up with a broken site. Um, you might wake up with complaints about not being able to update, but that's better than a broken site. And there's two ways to run unattended updates, which I will go into. One of them is run by a drush command, which you could set up in cron tab. And the other way is by a web request, you know, to like slash system slash cron. Um, so let me talk about both of those ways. Setting up unattended updates via drush, we wrote this command, drush auto update. It's, that's literally what it does. You run drush auto update. If there's an update, it does it all in one shot. And it is running at the command line, so because of that, there's a security advantage here, which is that the web server does not need to be able to write to the Drupal code base. And that's pretty good. Hey. Um, that's a pretty good thing because, I mean, the web server's job is to talk to the entire world and do whatever the world wants. So kind of better to run things as a separate user on the terminal in the background. This is the main advantage of doing it via Drush. There's also the fact that commands, uh, command line commands don't necessarily, aren't necessarily as prone to timeouts. Um, the con is that it's a little harder to set up. You got to go to cron tab, you know, and say, hey, you got to run drush auto update, you know, on some schedule. And it would look, the command would look something like that. So that's running them via drush. Running them via the web on attended updates. The setup is a little bit easier. Um, core's documentation suggests setting up a thing in cron tab that, you know, pings the system cron route every so often, which will run cron. That's how you would trigger automatic updates that way. The downsides being that um, the web server, sorry, the web server needs to be able to write to the, to the file system. It's a little bit risky from a security standpoint. Um, you know, web, web requests can time out more easily. So that's a little bit, that can be a problem. Um, unattended updates also do not work with automated cron right now for boring technical reasons. Um, but they don't work with automated cron. So if you're relying on automated cron to do cron stuff, um, you're going to need to set up uh, probably pinging system cron uh, in cron tab rather than do that. 
And that is one of the things we'll warn you about in the UI. We'll tell you like, yeah. hey, you have automated cron and you have automatic updates on. That's, um, and we guide you how to do it the other way. So those are the two ways of running automatic updates. Unattended via Drush, unattended via the web, or you know, just sit at the UI and do an attended update. It's nice and easy. So that's how you use it. What could go wrong? Um, famous last words for sure. Um, a lot of things could go wrong, but a lot of them, we, a lot of those problems, we will try to detect ahead of time. So you know, I don't want you to be scared of this. As I say, it does work pretty well. Um, some of the stuff that's probably most likely to go wrong, file permissions are the reason that I brought them up first on the other slide. Um, they can be a little tricky. They can be unpredictable. As I said, we're not scanning every single level. If you have 100 modules installed and 500,000 files in your Drupal site, it would take eons to scan every single one of them and make sure they were all writable. Um, and even if we did that, you know, while we are working on an update over in the stage somewhere, a file could, uh, permissions could get changed on something. So they're not necessarily predictable. They're a little bit tricky. If something like that changes and we can't write to, uh, can't write to a file that we need to, that'll break an update. Um, certain operations, particularly the create and apply phases of an update where we're just copying a ton of files back and forth, those could time out. Um, Simlinks used to be more of a pain point than they are now. It's, it used to be that if you had any Simlinks in your code base at all, we would just detect it and say, nope, no automatic updates for you. Um, that's improved significantly. It's now that you, you can use symlinks now, just not all symlinks under all circumstances. Um, certain kinds of things like symlinks on Windows, I'm sorry, Windows users. Um, hard links are not allowed, absolute links pointing elsewhere that are, that's not inside Drupal, those aren't allowed. But we're, more, we're a little bit more um, smart about this now. So these are some of the things that could go wrong. There could also just be a random sad, um, you know, I don't know, maybe, maybe the server gets struck by lightning or is stomped upon by Godzilla, I don't know. But that is why you always back up. Um, you should be doing this anyway. This is good life advice. Back up, back up, back up. The good news about problems going wrong during updates is that if something goes wrong over in the stage, who cares? It's a temporary copy of the site. It's not accessible. It is completely separate from the live site. So problems in the stage don't affect the live site at all. Good. This is true for every phase in an update except for the apply phase. The apply phase, as I mentioned before, is the most failure sensitive because that is the phase where we are literally just copying all the stuff from the stage back into the live site. So if something goes wrong in the middle of that, what you're going to end up with is a live site where some of the files are the old version of Drupal and some of the files are the new version of Drupal. And that's just not going to fly. Um, there's no way right now to recover from that scenario except to have backups, which is why you have to have backups. So have backups. If that happens, that is what, that's the only failure we consider to be a catastrophic failure. You will get an email. It says, hey, no, the update failed to apply in the middle of it. You need to restore from backup. But the good news is that we have had people testing automatic updates for a while to some extent, and we've never seen this reported. So. I think that generally it's going to be fine, but back up because it is a smart thing to do. So to recap all this, a lot of things have to be right for automatic updates to work properly, and especially file system permissions. And we check those things. It's the good news. Uh, attended updates are done in the UI. They're very easy. They're two clicks. If all goes well, it's done. Unattended updates are done while you sleep, and they can be run either by the terminal on a drush command or via the web. If something goes wrong in the stage, your site is completely safe and will be totally unaffected, except during the apply phase, where if it breaks while copying files from the stage to the live site, you are definitely going to want to restore from backup, restore your code, and you know just to be safe, your database also from backup. So back up before updating. That's the last time I'll say it. So getting towards the end here, this is a short session, but honestly, fine. Let's have coffee. Um, 
I want to talk a little bit about what automatic updates doesn't do, um, either yet or at all. Uh, rollbacks. So rolling back an update is not something supported by automatic updates. This is not something that has ever really been supported by Drupal. When you run update.php, there's no way to control Z that. Um, you know, it's a one-way street, updates in Drupal. So we don't support rolling back updates because Drupal doesn't really support that. We don't have built-in support for Git or version control, um, mostly because there's a lot of different ways to use Git. There's many different workflows. Trying to support that would introduce a lot of complexity for us for maybe dubious benefit. And the truth is, as I mentioned, Package Manager has event hooks. It fires events at many different points, and you can hook into those. And therefore, if you really want to have some sort of integration with Git or a version control system, that's something you can do with custom code. So it's not built into automatic updates. There's no built-in A-B testing. Um, you can't you know, create the stage and then do the update in that and then go see it before you apply. The reason is because the stage is, as I mentioned, not a, it's not a bootable copy of the site. It sits in a temp directory somewhere. All it has is code. It doesn't have your settings. It doesn't have your database. It doesn't have your uploaded files. Um, so it's probably a thing you could custom code in some way if you really wanted to. But in that case, you might already be kind of very well into the enterprise space. Um, and I don't know how much value you're getting out of automatic updates at that point anyway. So this is just not, this is just another complicated thing that we don't support out of the box, but if you are determined, I'm sure you could do it in some way. Automatic updates will also probably never do major core upgrades. It will not bring you from Drupal 10 to Drupal 11 because major versions of core uh, break backwards compatibility. That's what they do. That's their, kind of their point. Um, so we can't just update you to Drupal 11 while you sleep because backwards compatibility breaks virtually guarantee your site will be broken in the morning. Um, so not a thing that we will do, um, at least not for the foreseeable future. And I wanted to devote a whole slide to this about automatic updates, not updating contrib projects, because this is a thing that is clearly a useful feature. Um, so we wrote a module for it called Automatic Updates Extensions, which is included currently with Automatic Updates. It's going to not be in core, at least not for now, um, but it will be in contrib. You can use it if you're feeling very confident about it. It's still experimental. The reason Automatic Updates Extensions is not part of core's, not part of our, of our MVP in core is because backwards compatibility in contrib projects is really iffy. Core has really strict standards about what can change in any given release and how it can change, and those are very carefully enforced by the core committers for the very reason that they don't want to break sites. Contrib, bless its heart, can do absolutely anything it wants. There are no rules, um, which is a good thing, but it's dangerous when you're talking about automatic updates. So because Contrib themes, Contrib modules can break anything whenever they want, if they want to, um, it's not something that we necessarily want to support automatically. That being said, we do. Um, if you want to use it, you install automatic updates extensions. You go to the modules page, and there's an update tab, which will show you a list of modules that you can update. And it works basically the same way as automatic updates for core. So the main difference is we don't support unattended updates right now for Contrib. Um, and so basically, I mean, we're not it is probably as safe as running Composer, per se, right? Because we do check things that say you wouldn't run in a regular direct Composer command. So if you want to especially use it locally, you know, if you're, if you're updating modules locally, it's, you know, perfectly safe to use as far as, like, you should be, you'll be sitting in front of it and you'll be able to see the changes to your site. Yeah. But it's not, um, it's not part of core MVP, so we didn't build it into the main thing. But yeah, still experimental, but we definitely want people testing it out to see, you know, how can we get it to the non-experimental phase. And honestly, it's a hell of a lot better than like having to sit there and battle Composer at the command line to like figure out why your modules won't update. So yeah, that is a thing that maybe eventually we'll do it in core, but I don't want to promise anything. I think that would be really cool if we did. But speaking of core, so I started this whole thing by saying we are not in core yet uh, in automatic updates. But let me talk about what it's going to take to get there. Um, there's a few things. One, we have to do some infrastructure work on Drupal.org itself. 
Automatic Updates and really Package Manager uses something called the Update Framework, which has the very convenient acronym of TUF. Um, its job is to prevent supply side attacks, many different kinds of supply side attacks. And it's not specifically meant for, it's not a Drupal specific thing, but the idea here is if somebody set up a man in the middle attack on packages.drupal.org so it could send out malware to every site, every Drupal site that was using this, well, that would be bad. So uh, Tuff prevents that. And we've been working on this uh, while working on the automatic updates module. And it's going really well, but there are infrastructure changes needed on Drupal.org to support this properly, which we are working on. And the Drupal Association also, I want to just thank them because um, they've been working tirelessly on it as well, along with, I think, Consensus Enterprises and Tag1, possibly others. Okay. So this is something that we need to have in place kind of before we can get our um, reviews in. So because, can I say something about yeah, Tough? Yeah. So the update framework stuff that we're implementing, um, it's basically going above and beyond what Composer now offers you. So basically, it's not like we're introducing new security risks in the sense that we're offering to do updates in the background. And we're providing a UI, so if you give somebody access who you don't trust to your website, they can now update Drupal. But we're not introducing any new composer-oriented security risks that we now have to implement the update framework is. Basically because we're trying to do this for the whole Drupal ecosystem or anybody who wants to use it, we want to go above and beyond what you now would have if you went through composer through the command line. It's not necessarily that what we're doing is more risky than Composer itself. It's just we want to be more secure because you won't be watching your site when it happens. And when a critical security comes out, update comes out, and eventually we want you know a lot of Drupal sites to use this, then a lot will update you know within a few hours. So that's obviously a very tempting attack vec you know attack vec surface if you were malicious to go after the Drupal community. So. The idea is we want to be even more secure, as secure as we can possibly be. And so the update framework is, I think, was made by the Cloud Native Foundation, and it's used to update car software. It's basically a protocol of how you do it. So we don't think that because we're doing this all this stuff on Drupal.org, it's because we're doing more risky operations. It's just it's a bigger target, so we want to be even more secure. Fix the internet, basically. Um, so, after we have that, once we have tough support out on Drupal.org, we need to have review from the security team. As I said, Drupal rewrites itself with automatic updates, so uh, this is pretty security sensitive. So we need full review from the security team. And then after that, uh, we need regular core committer review, um, which is a very, very deep and very long process. Well, it doesn't have to be very long, but it's definitely deep. They read every line. Um, so these are things that we also need before we can get into core. Another thing we need, I think, is battle testing. We need real world testing. We're ready for this now. We just tagged an alpha of automatic updates three in contrib. And um, if you, if this is inspiring to you, if this is super useful to you, we would love for you to, to help us battle test it. This is absolutely the best way to help this initiative and to help this project right now. We're gonna have a boff um, in the contribution room um, immediately after this. So if you want help set, like setting this up, or you have questions, maybe you think this could be useful, uh, come bother us. That's what we're there for. Um, so when we have all this kind of stuff, I think, um, I think the road to core is clear, and hopefully we'll be in 10.2, maybe 10.3, somewhere in 10, definitely would like to be in Drupal 10. And with that in mind, that's everything I got. Um, got our boff in a few moments, slides. There's where the module is if you want it. Any questions? Yeah, so Aquia does have a, I mean, basically, the problem of, autom of updating your site, if you are able to do it 
in different environments is not the same as if you don't have multiple environments and you have to do it in the same space. I mean, it's, it's similar, but like what you need to do in the background is not the same. So Acquia does have a system for like, you know, providing uh, security updates to clients, but it is not exactly this system. Um, and we've talked to them about like integrations, but it's not, um, even though it seems like it's the same, it's like the same general problem space, but it's just the restraint. This is really focused on the restraint of you have a life site that you want to update to directly. So a couple things that we, you could do if you have continuous integration to use this is our drush command, presumably you could spin up, you could have something that makes an environment every once in a while, spins up this command, and it will change files, like the composer JSON file. You could see if it changed the, the, it will basically look out and see if it, there's security updates, and see if it's like to the policy that you chose, like security, not security updates. Um, and at that point, you could use your continuous integration pipeline to basically send it out to your clients or whoever, say, hey, we have an environment that applied an update. And depending on you know what the client wants to do, either we'll look at it or just directly push it over. So you could use that part. I mean, what we would get you is you don't have to write um, the logic for like parsing the update feed from Drupal.org to figure out if something is an update policy uh, is updated or not. Um, the other thing that we get you is potentially we look at the code base and say, okay, is there probably a database update that's going to apply? And if there is, that's not something that we do automatically. And that's probably something that no site really wants to do automatically and have nobody look at it. So that kind of stuff you could use in that sort of continuous integration environment and you wouldn't have to write that yourself. So it could be that, you know, you could send the client potentially at that point, like, oh, there was an update and it didn't have a security, it didn't have a database update. So it was, it's able to apply, able to be like either reviewed or pushed automatically. So could, you could use that tool. Um, right now it's a Drush command. Eventually within this core, it'll probably be a Symfony console command. But it's not gonna be something like out of the box. This initiative is just gonna take care of everything for you. Also because there's just so many ways that um, you know people want to do their continuous integration, which is not like something core is aware of. So yeah. Um, but I think the console command could be something that people could use. For the record, the question was, uh, is there a plan to support you know, more complex uh, enterprise use cases yeah. like Acquia hosting? And the thing that actually Peter pushed us to do this is probably not that tier, because Acquia doesn't support this, and a lot of hosting, a lot of like specific Drupal hosting doesn't support this, is the, the Drush command, and eventually the Symfony console command, does allow you to have your site write protected um, from the web server. You just run that command uh, as a different user who has higher privileges, say like every hour, every three hours or whatever. Um, so that is one thing that now I think we're covering a larger uh, base of sites that we used to not cover because we used to say, okay, your site just has to be writable from the web server, which was, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a balancing act of security. If you never apply security updates and then we say, okay, to use our stuff, you have to be writable, then it's like, okay, well now you have security updates, but you're writable, so you have to choose what's more valuable. But if you're willing now to go through the uh, you know, one-time step of setting up that Drush command, then you can have sort of both worlds of like um, a protected file system by your web server, but something that also gets automatically updated. MVP. In the MVP. Yeah. Yeah. Not never. Uh, have you guys floated the idea of trip modules opting into stricter semantic versioning so that automatic updates could? I have it. Yeah. I think that would be a really good idea. Yeah, and we've talked about it. Repeat the question. Uh, yeah. yeah. So have we explored the idea of basically having some way for contrib modules to say I am auto updates compatible because I'm following Simvormer? more strictly. I won't break things. I won't break BC and patch releases, basically. Um, yeah, we've talked about it. Um, it, I think, we obviously would need Drupal.org infrastructure changes, probably, too. So right now, I think that's not possible because, I mean, basically, we don't want to take the Drupal Association away from the work to getting the update framework done. So 
it's something we've talked about. It's just a matter of it would also. Um, so for the core update testing, for the testing that we're going to set up is related, uh, if you're interested in the BOF, is we're working on cron updates for, on, for contrib, unattended updates. And we want to test that with people who are opting in, who know the risks. And basically, because we want to look at like the future of like how we could do this. So if you're interested in, well, this all sounds great, but it's only useful if I can update contrib automatically, then come talk to us. Because you'd have to get set up with this first, and then when we finish the unattended updates for contrib, um, that we're going to test in an experimental way with like a small group of users, then we can see like how it works, what problems come up, and then we can get a better idea of like, okay, do we want this in core eventually? How, you know, what are the pain points people have? Is it really what people expect if it happens? So there's yeah, there's a lot of ways you could potentially even like opt in individual releases. This is automatic up. This is unattended safe or something, but sort of down the line, but interested in like how we could make that work. Back. Yeah, there's a function um, asking for the updates, uh, you know, the event switch there before that, but is, is there a way to make the uh, backup to the current core? Is that a So one thing I was interested in trying to work on at this DrupalCon is actually like, can we, like people who are rely would rely on us for backups, not our module, but Drupal. Like, I want my site to back itself up. I don't want to do it. There is the backup and write migrate module. I'm not. Sh I don't know the current status of it. It does say it's ten compatible, um, but they could p potentially pretty easily like hook into our event yeah. system and say we're going to do the database. And I know it supports database updates. I think it supports code updates, but I'm not sure if the Drupal ten version does. Yeah. But potentially there could be an integration module there, probably not on our side, but maybe on their side, that would do that for them. And basically, we would do it like in the pre-apply phase, so right before applying to the site. And one thing with the advantage of that is you can write in the event system that we have, you have validate in all the pre-events, there's validation. So basically, they could write something, do the backup, and if the backup w doesn't work, say an error, like don't do this update, because obviously, it doesn't help you if you say, okay, right before I'm gonna to try to do the backup, but then it didn't work, and then you update anyways. So they could actually stop the backup based on uh, the update, based on whether the backup actually worked or not. No question for the record. Oh. Um, yeah, is there a way to use the event hooks to uh, backup your site beforehand? Yeah, and, and code-wise, you could do whatever you want, but I think, I don't know, is backup and migrate still a thing, as far as like what people use it for? Anyways, it's a module that's out there. I think it has a lot of usage, so. Yeah. You could definitely custom code it if, you know, yeah. if all else fails. Yeah. yeah. I think you mentioned that you would apply update hooks for code. Can you talk anymore about that? Because you kind of expect them not to be in Apache. Yep. Yeah. So, update, so. Can I repeat the question? Yep. Yeah. So, he asked whether we, up, we run update hooks. Um, so basically, Drupal updates schema or database updates under, under certain circumstances. Usually happens in minor releases, but sometimes it does happen in patch releases. Um, right now, there's not a good way for like <clears throat> a hook update to tell you like, oh, I'm doing something very minor, it's probably fine. You know, run it unsended. Um, Th that is another thing we're also talking about, like can we figure out a way to somehow annotate or somehow let us know like this does something very minor. Um, right now, if it's in, um, if it's unattended, we look at the stage and we look at the active site and say, hey, are there any database updates that are gonna run? And we err on the side of predicting that there will be updates even if we get it wrong as opposed to Airing on the side that well maybe we'll miss some but we'll get most of them or whatever so um, so basically we look at the stage and unattended and say actually their database updates we're not going to run this and we'll email you to say hey we can't do this update automatically um, but if we don't find that we'll do it so if you're doing it via the form we will take you to update PHP afterwards if you're not familiar the hook up 
the update hooks are basically, if you go to update.php, it says, hey, there's some pending updates. That's what we don't run if it's unattended. Uh, most patch releases do not try to do this, uh, do not provide that, so most of them will apply. I think most security releases definitely don't have them. Yeah, so security releases, if, if you're not sure, they are always solely focused on like the one security thing they're trying to fix. So it's not like they're gonna roll a bunch of other things in that need uh, database updates. So most patch releases should be fine in the unattended. Um, even more security releases should be fine in the unattended. Um, but we do check to see, okay, did they for some reason need to do a database update? And in that case, we'll email you and say, hey, sorry, we can't run this. Please go to the forum and run it. The boff here? The boff is room. yeah in the sprint room, which is 408. So basically go up the escalator that way, like go across. You could either go across that courtyard, go up the escalator, and it'll be right on your right. Um, but there's a sign that says general contribution. I think Monday morning it should be pretty empty. <laughs> I'm guessing not everybody's full into sprint mode yet. So... Um, I didn't see where the, the boffs were to sign up earlier. So this will actually give us more time to do it. We're not time limited to be like, okay, we're done. We, somebody else is taking our table. So if you're interested. Other questions? Yeah. So yeah, we the the question was if you're using the patching uh, plugin for Composer, what happens if like you know you have a patch applied to Core and then it gets fixed in the next release? Um, you know what will happen there? What will happen there is we as part of our support, we we have very explicit support for the patcher, and one of the things we do is we make sure that if you have the patcher installed, it will Composer will freak out if a patch doesn't apply. Composer will exit. There's a flag for that. So. If you suddenly update to a version of Core that has that patch committed to it, the patch should fail to apply, and Composer will have an error, and the update will stop. So we're checking for that. We want to make sure that that doesn't that there's no conflict there. And we don't like we don't assume like oh the patch didn't apply it's definitely fixed let's just go on. Basically, yeah. if the patch doesn't apply, we we figure we can't do the update because. We don't actually know if the patch fails that it's because it was applied or just that code changed and now the patch doesn't apply. Right. So if the patch doesn't apply, then we say, sorry, we can't do the update, uh, and then we email you. So basically, we veer on the side of like not doing the update if we're not sure. We don't be like, ah, oh, it's probably fine. Let's do the update and we'll email them afterwards or whatever. So um, automatic updates. It tries not to update <laughs> if anything goes wrong at all. I mean, we're, our slogan. we're risk averse for now. Yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, Composer patches. Uh, that's one of the Composer plugins that we support um, because we know how it works and we've talked to the maintainer. Um, and yeah, we'll tell you if that setting is not on that to fail if um, if the patch doesn't apply. Yeah. And then we try to, well, actually, we don't try to apply it. The, the Composer plugin itself tries to apply the patch. And it will tell Composer, like, hey, some, you know, something didn't go right. So and we'll stop the update process. I think you mentioned that this does not take you from, like, version 10.0 to 10.1. Oh, it does. Okay. As long as you're sitting there making so it do it. You have to push the button. You have to push the button, yeah. Because the idea with minor updates of Drupal core, core is you should really be looking at your site and seeing if everything's okay. Yeah. Um, there's nothing technical that would stop us besides they usually always have database updates. There's nothing technical that would stop us from updating you via minor, but it's probably just not safe. Like you should look at the site and be like, yeah, it's fine. Also because minors aren't like a surprise, it's not like you're gonna wake up one morning and there's a new minor and you're not on it. You'll sort of know ahead of time. Like security, there is security updates also not a surprise in that we know the window, but there's a lot more of them, and you don't know if there is going to be one. So the idea is you shouldn't have to sit there on Wednesday and be like, or every every few Wednesdays. Yeah. And, and from sit. a security standpoint too, it's like if you're on the previous miner, those are almost those are still security supported. So if a security, if you're if ten one is the latest miner, you're on ten zero. 
and a security fix comes out on 10.1, it's almost certainly going to be backported to 10.0, unless it, unless it just doesn't apply to 10.0. So you'll still be secured either way. Yeah, right now Drupal Core itself, I think, is going to warn you if you're going out of security coverage. Yeah. And I think it warns you actually if you're on the, if you're on your status report, if you're not on the latest minor that you only have six months or so to get on to the next one. So if you're on, presumably with the two versions, the two minor version support of security updates is you should be able to run the unattended updates for a year and have it automatically update. And then, you know, every year you would have to go from like 10.1 to 10.3. Um, but that probably, you know, there'll probably be some in there, the patch release that might have database updates. So what you're not, it's not a guarantee that you won't have to go to the form before then. But the combination of Drupal Core's new like security policy of not new now, but for a while of supporting two miners at a time and us supporting all patch releases should get you a ways without having to go to the form and press the button. And that's time. So I release you all. Yeah, um, anybody wants to come up.